The planet's predominant superpower prides itself on its rules-based order and a constitution that codifies and sets in stone the transfer of power through the ballot box. A model and values the United States tries to uh, impose or at least sell on the world scene. But for all the laws, all the rules, there's Mao's line about political legitimacy, that power grows out of the barrel of a gun. With the election of Donald Trump and the January 6, 2021 storming of the U.S. Capitol, America deviated from the traditional left versus right divide. And now, five days out from an election that's too close to call, could that model change again? We'll ask about the security and the legitimacy of a process that's already begun in the U.S. Some 60 million ballots cast so far in early voting. Could the model of governance really change inside the nation that's home to Wall Street, Silicon Valley, that uh, keeps the peace inside of NATO, that defends South Korea and patrols the Pacific? If so, what is the plan for the rest of the planet? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking if U.S. democracy is under duress with us from Washington is correspondent Fraser Jackson. Thanks for being with us. From Irvine, California, he's a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, Republicans who've broken with Trump's brand of politics. Mike Madrid, senior fellow at the University of California, Irvine's School of Social Ecology. Uh, your latest book, The Latin Century. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. From Harlem in the Netherlands, former member of the European Parliament, Marietta Schako, fellow at Stanford's Cyber Policy Center and Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. Great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Craig Capitas is contributing editor to The Daily Beast. Welcome. Thank you. Your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, before we go to our panel, let's go to Craig Capitas' native Pennsylvania, the swing state that clinched Joe Biden's win in 2020. France 24 correspondent Jessica Le Maisonnier reports on a race that's as tense as it is close. In the battleground state of Pennsylvania at Luzerne County Courthouse, Republicans hurl insults at Democratic lawmakers. Fascist. Shame. On the agenda, a legal dispute over drop boxes, locked structures where voters can deliver their mail-in ballots. Statistics from the 2020 election show that Democrats are twice as likely to vote by mail than Republicans. Trump supporter TJ Fitzgerald pushes a misleading claim about illegal immigrants voting using drop boxes. Let's have some integrity and make sure that only United States citizens can vote and make sure that our votes count and no illegal stuff. Non-citizen voting is illegal and extremely rare. After the 2016 election, the Brennan Center surveyed local election officials in 42 jurisdictions with high immigrant populations and found just 30 cases of suspected non-citizens voting out of 23.5 million. That's just one vote in a million. Multiple analyses have shown that it is more likely someone will be hit by lightning than commit mail ballot fraud. There is no problem with drop boxes. <laughs> There's no problem. Oh, you're the problem. Excuse me. Hey. Order. Sorry. That no, you're not sorry. There have been issues with the vote in previous elections in Luzerne County. In 2022, for example, the ballot machines ran out of paper, but this was due to human error, not a conspiracy to rig the vote. Amongst the Trump supporters, MAGA influencer Scott Pressler. He was a foot soldier in the Stop the Steal campaign that spread the false claim that Trump won the 2020 election and culminated in the January 6th insurrection. Scott was on the Capitol grounds that day. He's part of a push to register Republicans to vote. Trump's daughter-in-law invited him on stage at a rally for the former president to thank him for his efforts. Pennsylvania, you have the power to change the world. Scott is not from Luzerne County, but he's moved here so that he can vote in Pennsylvania, a crucial swing state. We are going to turn Pennsylvania blood red peacefully and elect Donald J. Trump as the 47th president of the United States. Thank you very much. Yeah. He streams his activities on social media. I think the Democrats are going to pull any trick out of the book to try to stop Donald Trump, whether that's trying to imprison him, 
shoot him or stop him from winning this November, as we've seen. Ramilda Crocomo, the woman in charge of elections here in Luzerne County, is not having any of it. Words that are used at the meeting, something to the effect about red blood or something like that, that's a little troubling. There was a post of a mock-up of the character from V for Vendetta. The meme casts Scott as the vigilante hero in P for Pennsylvania in a reworking of a poster from a film which is about the violent overthrow of a government. That particular individual has come to our bureau uh, and tried to disrupt the staff, uh, which I have no time for, but he didn't impress me. Ramilda has received threats. She's concerned her electoral bureau might be targeted. She's not taking any chances. The drop boxes are bolted to the floor. There are surveillance cameras and boulders around the building to prevent vehicles from ramming into it. This political climate, it's beyond hate. It's venom. It's frightening. I think we're, we're a microcosm of what's happening in the country, and we are on the front lines. The vote has already started. All the talk over the risk of fraud has made some people nervous. I didn't believe in the integrity of the election in the previous one, and this one's extremely important, so I, fe I feel all that it was better to come in person and do it. TJ is part of the grassroots drive to register voters. In Pennsylvania, the vote could be decided on tiny margins. We have multiple places throughout the county that we put a desk, we put a tent up, and we get them to convert from Democrat to Republican or vote or register for the first time. In 2016, Trump flipped Luzerne County, which had long been a Democratic stronghold, and won the state of Pennsylvania by a narrow margin. In 2020, Trump won the county again, but lost the overall vote in Pennsylvania to Biden. TJ believes Trump won the previous election. He's convinced the Democrats cheated. They want to screw us over, they want us to shut up, and they want to take our country. And we are saying no well, more, no more. We are going to shout, we're going to scream, we're going to vote, and we're going to take our country back. Voter fraud is extremely rare in the United States. An Associated Press review of the six battleground states Trump disputed in the 2020 election found only 475 potential cases of voter fraud, which would not have changed the result in any state. Efforts to sow doubt in the integrity of U.S. elections is really about trying to undermine faith through repetition. It is about getting attention on the claims of doubt and not uh, about actually trying to address security of the vote. I think what is likely is incidences of, like, stochastic terrorism, where you have incidences of violence across the country in various places. Democrats are going door to door in Luzerne County because here every vote will count. They say the Republicans are spreading lies, laying the groundwork to contest the outcome if Trump loses. It's psychological warfare. It's a blatant attempt to spread propaganda, to spread disinformation among Democratic voters. I think that it probably will turn into somewhat of lengthy court battle. On a street a few blocks down, a pro-Trump household. A neighbor has made her own sign in response. I looked across the street and I saw these, like, Democrats are pedophiles and Democrats are terrorists. And I'm not a Democrat. I'm a registered independent, but I am voting straight blue. I don't understand there are so many that still believe the lies. If there's any fraud, I would say it would be on the other side, or maybe maybe planning fraud. He's got a sign over that it says, fight, fight, fight. I say, vote, vote, vote. Officials hope that disinformation and distrust won't lead to a nightmarish scenario on or around Election Day. Craig Capitas, based on your Pennsylvania experience, Elections are not for the faint of heart. Uh, there's always uh, tense moments. But when you look at those images of those uh, two houses across the street from one another, uh, what's your reaction? My reaction is that perhaps the most common of all follies is to passionately believe in the palpably not true. Uh, you know, this is the chief occupation of Trump cultists and, and, and his enablers, the jellyfish of the Republican Party. Uh, what can one say at this point? Information is not truth. And ignorance is now the lodestar 
for what's ailing America. And boy, isn't that dangerous to say. You're calling the American people, the people of Pennsylvania, ignorant. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is that they are undereducated. They are ill-informed. And if you look at U.S., the most important statistic you can get out of the United States government right now is that 52% of adult Americans cannot read beyond a sixth grade level. That's 11 years old. This is why we're seeing this. And I will leave it to others to parse all the specific reasons, the sociological reasons for this. But it's ignorance on a massive scale. As one of the uh, characters in the, in the uh, uh, story said, it's propaganda. And, and, you know, Trump's favorite billionaire, his pet billionaire, Elon Musk, is certainly doing a lot of the peddling here. But it's, 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 it's this ignorance. Mike Madrid, how would you characterize it? Well, I would characterize it a little bit differently. I'd say it's willful ignorance. Well, this is not just a problem endemic to the poorly educated. This is a problem that is endemic to a part of the country, half of the country, that wants to see a different vision of America and wants to find the information that confirms their existing biases. So I, I don't believe that it's a, a, entirely a problem of being poorly educated, although that's part of it. The other part is just willful ignorance. It's a desire to excuse data, excuse evidence, excuse facts, so that it comports to your reality, comports to the reality that you want to see. That doesn't make it any less dangerous, by the way. In many ways, that makes it more dangerous. Because what we are seeing is an entire political party setting up the predicate that this election is going to be a fake election or that it will be stolen. We're seeing a very sophisticated strategy of a number of different ta tactics, including uh, flooding the zone with what we call flooding the zone with bad polling, showing Trump winning. Uh, some of our main media outlets on the right saying that it's virtually impossible for Kamala Harris to win, uh, convincing millions and millions of Americans that there's no way he can possibly lose, holding rallies in blue states to say that to, to, to create the imagery that even Democrats are coming over and we're on the verge of an enormous landslide victory, so that in the great possibility that when Kamala Harris wins the election, um, they will have the groundwork to mobilize millions and millions of America in an angry, chaotic fashion. Uh, is it a question of, uh, uh, I'll put it to you, Marietta Shaka, uh, is it about the message that's being put out or is it about the way it's being put out? Gone are the days when uh, uh, an entire nation would get its news from the uh, eight o'clock television broadcast uh, bulletins. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people want their news feeds to comfort what they already believe. Well, but I think we've not yet mentioned the elephant in the room, which is that Donald Trump himself is feeding a narrative that if he were to lose this election, as he has uh, four years ago, that there must be fall play. So it's not just people behind their computers trying to find information or talking in groups of people of like-minded convictions. It is a political leader that is playing with fire. And I think that that is really dangerous. Uh, and we've seen Elon Musk spreading this same lie on X. Uh, the platform that he owns, but that he's also using as a mouthpiece for the Trump campaign, where he basically says, if Kamala Harris wins, there must be uh, fraud in the elections, where, uh, as was mentioned in your uh, report earlier, there is no evidence of tampering or uh, of any wrongdoing in the previous elections. There is not now. And so it is important to keep um, assessing any any claims because everybody has uh, their democratic rights that should be respected. But it is incredibly dangerous uh, playing with fire on the part of Donald Trump and his supporters who are willfully spreading lies. And it's a combination of the content, so uh, lies around the elections, other disinformation, drumming up violence, um, lies, including through manipulated images, and the way in which social media companies with their data-based targeting of advertisements and messages are actually tools in this propaganda machine. Tools in this uh, propaganda machine. And uh, as we're speaking, the Harris campaign rejecting fresh claims by Donald Trump of election fraud uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Mike Madrid, 
when is it, is it, could there be such a thing as too much uh, where uh, at one point there is a backlash? Too much in regards to the information or the messaging that's coming through? The messaging. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're still waiting for it. <laughs> I mean, it's been going on for many, many years now. I think what was just described is exactly right. It's the repetition of propaganda. And what I'm seeing now with a lot of Republican activists is, again, as I mentioned, it's willful ignorance. P people are even, will even acknowledge that it's propaganda, but they're okay with it because it comports with their reality. So no, I'm not seeing, there certainly won't happen, that backlash won't happen on a grand scale. People are choosing to lean into the propaganda. They're choosing to follow somebody that they know is not being truthful. They're, they're choosing to follow somebody who will acknowledge that we're, they're not telling the truth, that they'll say, you know, maybe there is no truth to the, the immigrants eating cats and dogs and pets story, but at least now we're talking about the issue that we want to talk about. By any other standard, this would have, you know, this candidacy would have been, um, you know, dismissed years ago. So, no, there, if, if there is a backlash, we're talking about the margins here. And I do believe, incidentally, that, we'll be, that there will be a higher number of Republican defections, specifically in Pennsylvania, which is the state where we had the highest number of Republican defections in 2020. We will have a higher number this election cycle, but we're talking about maybe 9 to 11 percent, 10 percent range. We're not talking half or 60 percent of Republicans breaking the fever dream and saying, oh, you know what, maybe I'm tired of the nonsense, maybe I'm tired of being lied to. Um, we're talking very, very marginal movements uh, on the fringes of this thing. Yeah, and uh, the way it's being covered in this home stretch uh, uh, has also been divisive. Campaigns dr drive ratings, thanks to fervor and outrage. Since this week began, let's see, there's been uh, the outrage of uh, Puerto Rico being described at a Trump rally in New York as a floating island of garbage. Joe Biden calling Trump supporters garbage, uh, which uh, provoked a backlash. Trump seizing the moment at the wheel of a garbage truck Wednesday at a rally <laughs> in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Joe Biden's comments were the direct result of Kamala's decision to portray everyone who isn't voting for her, which is a lot of people, as evil and subhuman. And we know it's really what they believe, because look at how they've treated you. Uh, they treat you like garbage. They treat our whole country like garbage, with open borders, with all of the horrible things they've done to hurt our country, inflation that should have never happened. And we know we have an opportunity in this election to turn the page on a decade of Donald Trump trying to keep us divided and afraid of each other. That is who he is. This is someone who is unstable, obsessed with revenge, consumed with grievance, and out for unchecked power. Craig Capitas, she made those statements in Harrisburg, uh, Penn, the capital of Pennsylvania. Uh, how does that resonate with Pennsylvania voters, her message? Oh, I, th I think it does. I think there is going to be a big surprise in Pennsylvania. I think viewers should be aware when you hear Bucks County. Bucks County is a suburb of Manhattan. It has nothing to do with Pennsylvania, despite what you might hear on American cable channels. Um, I, I, th I think what it's going to come down to in Pennsylvania, and this is just my gut instinct, is that the women of Pennsylvania are going to put Donald Trump in his grave, his political grave, not the men. You know, there, th this, I think, is the most important thing. There are 90 million women voters, from what I understand. 70% of the women in the United States are registered. So if the women get out in Pennsylvania, let alone the other states... I think, uh, I think it's going to put Harris over, over the top. Um, but I don't think the American media, not this show, we cover it differently here in France, but I think the American media for the past 10 years has normalized the tyrant. They don't know how to cover this clown stick. Um, and... Uh, yeah, but we things, don't... things like, for instance, fact-checking in real time during debates, it how boring. kind of doesn't... How boring. How boring. You know, the, the problem with describing Trump accurately as, as the leader of, you know, the Turd Reich is, is, is that ridicule is a shield. It's not a weapon. 
And, and, and as much as the satirist in me, the writer in me, wants to ridicule Trump, I, I, I don't think we can afford to do it anymore. This man is a tyrant. And, and uh, if the women don't get out to vote, the world is going to be stuck with him for another four years. And God help us, we're going to be whistling past the graveyard. Uh, Maria Tshaka, there's this sort of blurring of lines, isn't there, between uh, what is uh, fact, uh, what is entertainment, as uh, Craig was just mentioning, uh, uh, a lot of the, the news, the way people are getting informed now is by looking at comedians and satirists yeah. on both sides. What does that tell you about the age we live in? Well, what we're seeing in the United States is that reality is stranger than fiction. And it's a very dangerous reality. Craig mentioned that the women need to come out to vote. And this is, of course, because women's rights are under pressure. They're being taken away. Uh, the need to have an abortion is removed as a choice for women, which is uh, putting women's lives at risk. Uh, reproductive health rights are under pressure uh, at the hands of the Republicans. So I really hope that this is not just a male versus female issue where females have to come out to defend their own rights, but that there will be uh, masses of Americans who will say, we do not want to go back in time. We want to uh, not surrender the rights that we have fought for for decades and sometimes centuries. And of course, what Donald Trump and the Republican Party are doing with their vile comments about immigrants is scapegoating the most vulnerable people uh, in a society, in the margins of a society. And it's a deliberate strategy. Uh, and that's how it should be seen. So this whole entertainment value, to me, it's, it's you know, it's horrifying. I don't see how this can be uh, entertaining. And I think it is, it is a tragedy that um, he was able to build a uh, fan base, a popularity through entertainment television and then step into politics and, and really, you know, still sort of seeing it as one big game show, it seems, whereas what is at stake is democracy and indeed uh, with huge ripple effects around the world, including here in Europe. Yeah, and so Marietta, when you talk about uh, it being, uh, truth being stranger than fiction right now, we're seeing, by the way, those are live images from New Mexico of Donald Trump at a rally. Um, do, 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 do you have the sense that the United States is no longer what it was? Of course, this is very clear. I mean, it's not a reliable partner. A lot of countries are preparing and probably should be preparing more intensely for a Trump victory. We've already heard J.D. Vance, his vice presidential candidate, threatening Europeans with the U.S. stepping out of NATO if the EU were to regulate Elon Musk's companies. But why, how do you explain that. it? Why, why is there this nativist withdrawal from, from, from its role as the keeper of the global Pax Americana? Well, because Trump is ultimately uh, playing into nationalist sentiments and uh, everything is a bargain for him and his supporters. So they're perfectly fine to start trade wars to alienate Europe if, you know, if it gets him to uh, the vote first or if it can support uh, Elon Musk, whose dollars they're now very interested in. And of course, Elon Musk must be supporting uh, Trump and Vance because he hopes that his businesses will benefit or that some regulations will be will be weakened vis-a-vis -vis the tech sector. Right. It's all instrumental. And I think that that is the tragedy. There's hardly any principle left. There's hardly any appreciation of history in the broad sense of the word, whether it is uh, the post-Second World War world order that actually America has built, uh, or whether it is an appreciation for how easily um, democracy can be destroyed by people who are attacking it. And I think historic lessons should probably inform people as they go to the vote uh, in the United States. So Donald Trump, as you heard Kamala Harris say in that clip, may be aggrieved, but there are legitimate grievances among his supporters. Um, and let's take, take a look at the U.S.'s place in, uh, on the globe in, in statistics. The U.S. share of the world economy has grown in the past year to a whopping 26 percent. But that's not taking into account huge inequality. What you're looking at is if you adjust a GDP per person regarding purchasing power parity, the U.S. falls behind China and the European Union to 15 percent. 
uh, of uh, the world's um, uh, growth, not not uh, 26 anymore. So, Mike Madrid, uh, he, he, is Donald Trump tapping into something real? Yeah, there's no question. This is not all entirely a facade. There's a lot of it. But to, to dismiss the realities of what is happening with our non-college educated working class uh, is would be just as dangerous as, as just dismissing it outright or, or saying that this is entirely just fraud. There is absolutely something real driving this. And I don't believe that it is being addressed nor has it been addressed. My area of expertise is with Latino voters. It's the fastest growing segment of the electorate and it's the one that is moving the furthest to the right the fastest. And it, it, poll after poll will show that there is severe economic stress and and uh, a, a lack of confidence in the rule in the Democratic Party to handle the economy. And and and, and there, it, there's a lot of data backing up that that is a very real, very valid sentiment. And what they have been hearing from this administration is the stock market's doing great. Everybody's retirement accounts are doing wonderfully. Job jobs are up. Wages are up. But the affordability problem that is severely hampering our middle and lower classes is truly extraordinary. Uh, the tripling of interest rates that happened during this administration, the devaluation of our currency by 25%. This is a working class person's, uh, I don't want to say a nightmare, but pretty darn close. And, and, there, and has to be, there has to be some acknowledgement that these problems are being fed by something very, very real, because they are. Uh, you heard uh, Craig Capitas at the beginning of our conversation uh, d describe the underfunding the, uh, of education, uh, the, the, the problems that uh, ail middle and working class voters in the United States. Is it not the result, seen from Europe, it looks like it, uh, of decades of uh, uh, the gutting of public services in the United States, the fact that uh, the, the government's been undermined in its efforts? Sure. I, I, look, I, I'm not in the business of fixing the blame here. I, I'm in the business of, of finding the solutions. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around in this country. I'm not pointing it out to, to the right or to the left. I'm saying we have a very serious problem that needs to be addressed. But my question is why this isn't more the center of the conversation at this point. Uh, that, that, I think, is one of the great challenges of our time. You have both parties that are entirely consumed by cultural issues, entirely. You just heard the, uh, you know, the, the conversation talking about abortion rights and reproductive rights. I'm not going to dismiss that. I support those. But that is not the driving issue of the electorate. That it is for a very small sliver of, 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 of voters, especially those that have higher college education levels. What we're hearing over and over is the number one issue has been the economy. But both parties are speaking overwhelmingly to cultural issues. And that's a function, I think, of a broken political system that speaks just to the extremes of its own base, as opposed to trying to speak to the fastest growing segment of the electorate. All right. While uh, the U.S. Uh, votes, uh, war continues uh, in the Middle East, and there is this sense of an interregnum, what with it looks like at, the, at this hour, uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, P, a plan to get a ceasefire for Lebanon that seems to be falling through. Uh, meanwhile, and you're seeing those images there, uh, U.S. allies in Ukraine and South Korea uh, huddling in Washington. Our correspondent Fraser uh, Jackson uh, uh, joins us now. Fraser, earlier in the conversation, Marietta Shaka is talking about how the whole world is, is watching uh, this election, and there's this kind of wonder, is the U.S. in a sort of a, a vulnerable period during this uh, interregnum where you have an outgoing president and, uh, uh, and we're not sure which side is going to win the election? Well, I, I, think, I think any country is in a vulnerable uh, position when there's a transfer of power going on. That is obviously when any democracy that is, is at its most vulnerable. And I heard from a source inside the British government that that was part of the reasoning behind why they uh, had their elections when they did was because they were slated to be around the same time as the American election. And there wasn't, they didn't see um, much benefit in having two of the Western powers uh, going through this vulnerability period at the same time. Of course, I, it's one thing I hear mostly 
from my uh, European colleagues here in the US is obviously the worry about what uh, what the uh, you know future looks like for NATO, for Ukraine, uh, but also the Middle East is a big issue which is also taking up a lot of political political oxygen in the United States among the electorate as well. So it, it is a very uh, a very touchy time at the moment. I think a lot of people are just kind of holding their breath, waiting to see uh, what will happen one way or another. Uh, but of course, that that amount of uncertainty is arguably something that could be hijacked and could be weaponized in some sense uh, by some of the uh, American foes and the foes of uh, other Western nations as well. Craig Kapitas, uh, just a short while ago, uh, the U.S. Defense Secretary saying there are now 8,000 North Korean troops uh, in Russia's Kur uh, Kursk province near, near Ukraine's border, and we've had an intercontinental ballistic missile test by Pyongyang this, uh, this Thursday. Uh, the U.S., again, we talk about the Pax Americana. There's they're the keepers of, uh, uh, they're key to security for so many countries. Is that what they told you? <laughs> we're, the key, we're the key to giving countries money to secure themselves more or less now. I, I, I mean, I don't, you know, all those years I, I spent in Russia and the past three years covering this, this, this conflict in Ukraine, I don't know what to say anymore. I, uh, this thing is going to go on and on. It's starting to... To, to, your, your, your question's a logical one. It's a reasonable one, Francois. But uh, the Ukraine situation there, <clears throat> uh, no matter who they bring in, the North Koreans, it's, it's starting to reflect what's going on in the Middle East, which has been going on since biblical times. In the age of deterrence, you know, in the, in, during, the old, during the Cold War, would the North Koreans have been able to do that? No way. They're, look. I, 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 I can guarantee you, because I knew these people in the Reagan administration, the Bush one administration, if, if anyone, former government official like Trump been having, had been having private conversations with the leader of Russia, they would have been prosecuted immediately. They would have been arrested. They would have been questioned. And this points to what um, I think Bob was saying about, the, uh, about everyone's responsible here. The Democrats are feckless, gormless, They've got no guts whatsoever. They, 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 this never, whether you were a Republican or a Democrat, this kind of nonsense, I guarantee you, would never have taken place during the Reagan or Bush administration during uh, uh, the Cold War. It just wouldn't have happened. So, so I don't know what to say anymore because my knowledge base of how governments, the U.S. government specifically, is supposed to react to an incursion of North Korean troops on NATO's western frontier. I, I don't have the data for that. That's that that's right. not that's not in my workbook anymore. Uh, Marietta Shaka, do you uh, feel as though the U.S. Uh, is lacking leadership when it comes to issues like Ukraine? Well, the war in Ukraine has been allowed to go way too far, and there's been too much uh, relying on the Ukrainians themselves without giving them the arms that they need. But what I think is another point of, of international politics that is really hitting home in the United States is, of course, uh, the uh, the war in the Middle East, the situation in Gaza. And we just saw how close called some state elections will be. And I, I am really watching Michigan, for example, in the United States, to see what impact the, in my opinion, very, very misguided U.S. support for Netanyahu's uh, actions in Gaza and Lebanon will mean for domestic politics. So this whole idea that you can withdraw within your own country and then uh, withdraw from the world is also not playing out. The domestic and the foreign affairs are very much intertwined, and the whole situation in, in Israel, Gaza, Lebanon really underlines that once more. Hmm. Coincidence with the calendar, the election in the U.S. is next. Next Tuesday, and guess who's hosting an EU summit next Thursday? That's right, it's the most Trump-friendly leader of the uh, bloc of 27, Viktor Orban's Hungary. Uh, the man who said he'd pop open champagne bottles if Trump wins uh, is, uh, was uh, earlier in Vienna to congratulate the new Putin-friendly far-right speaker of uh, Austria's uh, parliament. Maria Tashaka, you look at uh, Viktor Orban, you think... Uh, 
Hungary is a small nation inside of uh, 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 of the European uh, Union. Uh, that uh, this is uh, just a bit of gesticulation, uh, or uh, that summit uh, in Budapest uh, next week uh, could be one where he pushes the uh, EU to congratulate Donald Trump. Well, we'll have to see, but Viktor Orban and his Trumpian policies in the EU are uh, unfortunately not just confined to his small country. Uh, the relatively small country that I'm sitting in, the Netherlands, has a uh, government with a far-right party that won the largest segment of the vote in our country. It is a growing voice in our uh, democracies, and it is really something to worry about. Democracy is under pressure globally, but also from within. And there used to be a time where the Orbans of this world were fighting to leave the European Union. Now they're celebrating the extent to which they're changing it from within. Uh, I think a summit will be uh, merited after the US election, no matter the outcome. So European leaders must come together and see what the implications are for the continent. But the whole idea that um, Orban or the Hungarian people or anyone in Europe would benefit from a Trump victory is, of course, uh, is absurd. Um, and the idea that um, the nationalism in the U.S. would somehow benefit his nationalism in Hungary. I, you know, it's it's all and just, just, uh, symbolic. Just, just very briefly on this, Marietta, as our, our Brussels correspondent Dave Keating points out in his Substack column, the, the far right is on the march throughout Europe. You just mentioned it. We can maybe call up a map uh, that, that shows these are uh, how far right nations have done uh, throughout the continent. And uh, Fraser will be happy to see we're including... Uh, the, the UK in that, uh, uh, and uh, f f f countries where the far right is in go is leading uh, is in government or leading uh, the government. Uh, of course, the biggest one there being uh, being Italy uh, in a coalition. Uh, uh, Marietta, is this the Trump model that's being exported, or are we are we giving Donald Trump too much credence? Well, Orban was there in politics a long time before Donald Trump was. Um, the nationalists are working together. They are copying from the same playbook, which includes lies, which includes scapegoating immigrants, uh, which which really includes this uh, illusion of bringing back control to within the borders. Uh, but it's unfortunately very popular, and I think it's it's related to the earlier uh, point made that a lot of grievances are under addressed. Uh, but it's also related to the phenomenon that uh, it doesn't even matter whether claims are true anymore. Uh, the sentiment is now what matters most. And in that kind of environment, um, lies are, are reigning. And it is, uh, it is very, very depressing to see how successful that strategy has been, both in the US and in Europe. And it's important that people who care about the rule of law and the future of democracy stand up and say, we won't accept this. Craig Kapitas, last year you went uh, to, uh, uh, you got to see Donald Trump up, up close and personal. The yeah. people that were around him, this was in West Palm Beach. We had dinner, we had dinner at, together. At, at, his, at his base. People around him, <clears throat> they, they're clear-eyed. For them, it's tr is it transactional? Yeah, it's totally transactional. I mean, you, um, you know, I was with him for two hours at a table having dinner. You know, you walk into this thing and, you know, they play music when he walks in. And you think you're going into the Burger Brow Keller in 1923. You're going to see some kind of push going on. But what it really is, it's like going to a North Korean dinner party with Kim Jong-un. You know, they everyone stands up. They, they nod their heads. Uh, uh, no one contradicts him. <clears throat> he and, and what you leave with, I, I you know, this is a guy who just wants people to pay attention to him. He will not let anyone get in a word edgewise. He asks insipid questions. Um, you know, this thing, with, and they played the Potemkin Village People song, you know, YMCA. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's silliness, and they nod. And if anyone, some of the people at the table I was at with, there were about six of us, uh, a few of the people at the table I was with had, disagreements with him on Ukraine. Uh, and Trump came down on them like the prince of friggin' darkness. And everyone else at the table and those standing around the table listening to our conversation uh, just nodded their heads, nodded their heads. All right, and uh, Mike Madrid, that's just kissing the ring so you can get what you want? 
I think so. I think one of the really uh, dark parts of this chapter in American history, when we look back, will be how the enabling class, it was the enablers that uh, allowed this to kind of grow and grow and grow and get out of control. There have always been these peculiar, strange, dangerous elements in society. There always will be. But the, 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 there's always also been filters that have, where people of courage and principle have stood up and said, this is not right, and we're not going to allow this to grow anymore. There's a sense of national shame about these things. There are certain norms that you do not um, break. Uh, Donald Trump has surpassed all of those, not just doing it himself through sheer force of will, but by surrounding himself with um, a multitude of enablers who will do, as the gentleman just said, just nod their heads at the absurdity. Nobody will say the emperor has no clothes. And until somebody does, it will continue to kind of proceed the way that it does. And unfortunately, um, it gets more difficult to stop it the, the, the larger it grows. And that's kind of where we find ourselves in this country um, of five days before an election. The problem here is, is if people with money vote for Trump, there's a good chance he's going to win again. Because one of the things that you go away with after sitting with him and his his friends, and I, you know, this wasn't a story, I was a private guest, but watching, watching this and listening to it is that this group of people, as wealthy as they are, when Trump says something like, I'm going to eliminate income taxes 100%, and we're going to make all our money off of tariffs, they believe him, even though they should know better. That's the whole thing. Their eyes get wide. There's a, I, yeah, there's it's a, remarkable. It's uh, remarkable to witness. Uh, there's a lot of magical thinking, Fraser Jackson, uh, uh, going around. Uh, I, I know that... Uh, uh, you know, everybody's wondering, uh, looking for signs, for trying to read tea leaves at this point. So uh, I'm going to put you on the hot seat and give you the final word. <laughs> What's the mood where you are five days out? Honestly, Francois, who knows? It's been... <laughs> Thanks for In that. the last two weeks, everybody is... It's... It's... This is the closest election. I mean, in my relatively short life, this is the closest election I've ever seen. That is the same sentiment that is shared by pollsters who've been doing this for decades, analysts who I talk to who've been doing this for decades. One of my most beloved colleagues here at the White House is covered six presidents now. He's never seen anything like this before. It, it honestly is unprecedented, is a word that gets banded around nowadays, but it, it is truly unprecedented. We've not seen anything like this in American political history, at least not in modern pol political history. Uh, and right now, everyone is trying to read into every small vote, every small poll that comes out. And honestly, the fact of the matter is, I think we're just going to have to wait till, till election day and see what happens. That is, uh, as, that's, as, that's as acute as... Uh, as sharp as my political insight gets, sorry, Francois. <laughs> All right, well, uh, the France 24 debate is coming your way. We'll have special editions uh, next week and, of course, coverage uh, on election night here on France 24. I want to thank you, Fraser Jackson. I want to thank Mike Madrid for being with us from Los Angeles, Maria Tashaka from Harlem in the Netherlands, Craig Kapitas, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.